<coughs> Order. And could I just uh, clarify for members uh, before we start question time that following uh, this uh, question time session, there will then be uh, the consent motion on the public bodies' abolition of food from Britain, Order 2014, just to correct maybe the impression that uh, we were moving straight on to the adjournment. And uh, if that is satisfactory, then I call uh, Mr. Stephen Moutry. Question number one, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Thank the member for the question, and with your permission, if you will yes, come, call you, I uh, require perhaps an extra minute or so to give an answer to it. I understand that the member has clarified that his question refers to the next tranche of dereliction funding rather than the second tranche. I recently invited bids in anticipation of further financial resources becoming available for the next tranche of dereliction funding. It is both encouraging and of concern to note that 23 of the 26 councils made submissions for proposals to effect improvements and enhancements in their areas. It is encouraging because it provides clear evidence that the scheme is both welcome and effective, since nearly every council wishes to benefit from it. It is of concern because it draws our attention to the fact that there is still a real and significant job to be undertaken across the north in tackling eyesores which have a detrimental visual effect. The dereliction intervention programme has a fine history. The initial proposal was to reduce the potentially negative impact of some rundown areas in the Port Rush and Port Stewart area quickly and in time for the influx of visitors to the prestigious Irish Open in 2012. It did exactly that. The next major project was in making improvements to my home city, our home city, in the run-up to and during its tremendous City of Culture year in 2013. I know from personal experience how effective the project was in supporting and enhancing the visitor experience. Another high-profile intervention improved the visual environment for visitors to the G8 meeting in May of that year. As well as these larger projects, there have been many, many smaller improvements across numerous council areas. By all reports, these have been both welcome and acclaimed. It is obvious the scheme has had a remarkably positive impact, particularly when measured against the comparatively modest sums employed. It is clear also that there has been a beneficial impact and that adjacent and nearby private property owners have been encouraged by the uplift to the area generated by small and large schemes and have responded by tidying and renovating their own properties. This is a very helpful byproduct which had been envisaged in the creation of the programme. I have made a strong bid in the June monitoring round for £1 million for dereliction intervention funding. The executive has not yet completed its considerations of the round, but I will be pressing the case for provision for this excellent scheme. It is fundamentally important that the executive ensures that the impetus and momentum built up in the programme's early years should be maintained. If, as I hope they will, executive colleagues provide resources for the dereliction programme, I will ensure that they are allocated amongst councils as soon as practicable thereafter. Did that in the three minutes, Minister Mr. Moutry, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. And I accept what he says in relation to the success of the funding that has been allocated so far in that what it, in and what it has achieved. But can I ask him if he is successful and there is more funding allocated, will he personally see to it that councils like Craig Avonborough Council, who were not successful on the last occasion, are available to avail of it on the next time? Thank you for that wee bit of extra time. Hopefully it doesn't lead to penalties. Uh, I thank Mr Moutry for that uh, supplementary question. He quite rightly identifies the success of this fund, and that is evidenced by the demand for this funding from councils. Hopefully my bid is successful, and if my bid is successful, I will have my officials consider all bids from all of the 23 councils who have bid. If there is a council that has, as to date, been unsuccessful in applying for the fund, then evidently there might be work that needs to be done 
with that council, between that council and my own officials, and I will ensure that that is done and that suitable bids are put forward by councils for work, much needed work in their areas. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I say to the Minister that the Department has recently hardened up on its definition of dereliction? And the Minister might agree that areas between buildings or disused and underused land, dilapidated streetscapes, it would be a good thing if provision could be made within the grant for works to be done in these areas, even if it required some element of match funding. I would welcome the Minister's thinking on that. Samuel Shin, I thank the member for that interesting question and interesting point that he has raised. His dereliction goes beyond buildings, and he refers to gap sites, if you like, and you can almost think of a, a row of teeth. <laughs> it's the one that's missing that causes that row to be ugly rather than the ones that are there. I, I am aware that in some bids from some councils there has been a covering up of those gaps, if you like with hoarding and so forth, creatively adorned, maybe by local community groups and artists. However, I'm unaware to date as to whether any significant or substantial actual building work has been initiated on those sort of sites as a direct result of the dereliction fund. Like I say, I'd certainly be open to the, the member's suggestion. And I call Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Could he confirm what cooperation, if any, his department has enjoyed with the Department of Social Development regarding these matters, with particular reference to public realm schemes? Uh, I thank the member for that supplementary question. This is a, a very important matter, and it's one that I'm happy to say that there has been coordination between my own department, my officials, and those within the Department of Social Development on. The reason that many people, including myself previously, would cite for dereliction and problems such as vacant properties faced in our towns and city centres is down to a lack of coordination between government departments. So I think it's extremely important that all departments work together. I can ensure that my department and my officials work with other departments. In this case, social development. The Department of Social Development are charged with urban regeneration uh, and community development. I think it's vitally important that we do work together, particularly in these times of straightened budgets, in order to ensure that we and the public are getting the biggest bang for their buck. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alec Easton. Question number two, Deputy Speaker. On the 11th of April 2013, the Executive agreed the functions of Northern Ireland departments that should transfer to the new 11 councils on the 1st of April 2015. It was agreed that off-street parking, with the exception of park and ride and park and share parking places, and Donaghadee Harbour and its management, would transfer to councils from the Department for Regional Development. In accordance with the Executive Agreement, it is for individual ministers to decide on the detail and manner of functions and services transferring from departments to new councils. The Department for Regional Development and the other transferring departments, including my own, have been working closely with local government sector holders in the Transfer of Functions Working Group, which has been established to facilitate the effective transfer of new powers to councils. The group has been working to identify the governance operational and financial implications and consider possible solutions for addressing these before they are presented for political decision. The progress of the working group has been regularly reported to me in my capacity as chair of the Regional Transition Committee. Each department that is transferring functions or powers has now submitted comprehensive information on the resources, budget, staff and assets attached to the package of functions and powers to transfer to local government. Work is underway to provide final allocation models for each of the new councils. Officials in my department will continue to work in conjunction with the Department for Regional Development officials to facilitate the smooth transfer of the agreed functions 
from government departments to the new councils. Call Mr. Easton for a supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for his answer? Could I ask the Minister if he could give reassurances that staff's terms and conditions will be the same once they transfer over to councils? I thank the member for his supplementary question and assume that it refers directly to DRD staff who are currently carrying out the functions that will be transferred to the local councils. Different uh, ministers, as I have said, will take different views on how assets should transfer, those assets being such things as budgets and, very importantly and crucially, staff. Uh, as regards DRD, the staff will come across. <laughs> My own department will be transferring the staff associated with the functions that we are transferring to local councils. I know uh, DSD are taking a different approach. They are transferring the functions of community development and urban regeneration and the budget that is currently associated with the staff and then it will be up to the council to decide how to spend that budget, whether or not they will take the staff in on secondment from the DSD. But uh, I think it is vitally important that staff are protected within this whole, this whole transfer or transformation of local government. They are what makes local government work and it's not going to work without them. Well, Mr. Mr. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister what training will be offered or provided to councils and councillors who will soon have statutory powers for parking in uh, town centres? I got. Uh, thank the member for that uh, supplementary question. And having seen him try to park outside, I think he could certainly do with the training himself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I have, on several occasions within this chamber, spoken of the importance of capacity building and training for members of the new councils. And a lot of the focus has been on the headline functions that are transferring, such as planning, or the brand new functions, such as community planning, and how we will build members' capacity to deal with those issues. I have to say, this is the first occasion on which capacity building for this particular function has been raised, but I can assure the member that it will be addressed within the extensive capacity building programme that is currently being rolled out for uh, the members of the new councils. Mr John Dallet. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I wonder could the Minister tell the House if he was suitably impressed by the proposals from the Department of Social Development to reduce the uh, transferring budget? to meet their own comprehensive spending targets. I uh, thank Mr Dallet for that question. I am aware that the most recently proposed DSD budget allocation, which was issued just a fortnight ago on the 16th of June, continues to be based on the assumption that transferred resources will be subject to a 4% reduction as part of the 2015-16 executive budget process. This is an area that, in my opinion, will certainly require further discussion to resolve. In my view, this position is certainly not consistent with the assurance provided to councils that the transfer of functions would be rates neutral at the point of transfer. But I will continue to make this case, as I have been doing with the Minister for Finance and Personnel and with other executive colleagues. It is vitally important, as I, we, we spoke about the importance of transferring the functions that the staff are equipped and have the capacity to deal with them. It is also important that the budget is there to de deal with the these issues as well. And I believe that there could be a detrimental impact on confidence within councils, confidence, within, or confidence in the whole process of local government reform should we start cutting budgets before we even transfer the functions. Mr. Kenahan. Thank you very much, um, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you for the Minister for his answers so far. And you have touched on the transfer of planning powers, but would you give more detail on the process of those transfer of planning powers and the planning service staff? And will, are you confident it will all be in place for next year? I uh, thank Mr. Kinahan for his question. 
I will certainly not try to hide the fact that this is very challenging. Uh, planning on itself is a contentious, and, or often contentious, often complicated area. Transferring this function to local government is, in, in my opinion, fraught with risk. However, I do believe and have confidence in the fact that the capacity building programme put in place uh, by my department and currently being rolled out. In, in terms of planning, we have uh, community places on board as well to assist with training for the, the, the new members. I believe that, that will give both the competence and the confidence to uh, councillors to deal with planning issues. We are not going to just cut them, cut them adrift at the 1st of April. The department will retain an oversight role as other transferring departments will over the functions that they have transferred to ensure that new councils are dealing with planning applications as they should be. I know uh, next week I intend, I intend to attend the first shadow planning committee meeting of uh, the Derry and Straban Council. I, I know part of the training process will include role play, it will include uh, mock meetings and so forth, but it is a very extensive and intensive programme of training and I believe it, it will deliver. Thank you. And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Question number three to the Minister, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. From my perspective, the process is relatively straightforward, although as of yet unproductive. I tabled a paper for executive decision on the 30th of April this year and followed it up with an urgent procedure paper to the First and Deputy First Ministers on the 8th of May. I then followed this with a version two of my original paper on the 18th of June. My department also made a bid for capital funding of £900,000 at June monitoring, the outcome of which requires an executive decision. To date, the business case has still not been discussed by the executive and no decision has been made regarding the capital funding requested by the Council. I I am still, still committed to funding all reasonable costs associated with the seal sanctuary up to a limit of £120,000 per year. Mr. McCarthy, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank Minister Durkin for his fairly positive response um, and indeed for his support all along, um, including Ardsborough Council, Friends of Explorers. Uh, trade unions and the public in general, and indeed members of this, uh, this assembly, uh, to see explorers retained and indeed rejuvenated. Can I ask the minister to give us an assurance that he will do all in his power um, to see, and then in the interest of explorers staff and indeed the economy of the Ards Peninsula, that the um, capital required to rejuvenate um, the explorers. Um, will come along as soon as possible to enable Ardsborough Council to withdraw, hopefully, the closure plans they have already put in place, and um, that that will enable the Council and Explorers to move forward positively. I thank uh, Mr McCarthy for that supplementary question. I will try to make my answer as long as it. Uh, I certainly uh, do recognise the value of explorers to the local economy in the Port of Ferry area and recognise what it contributes also as an educational facility. I uh, myself visited explorers uh, recently and was quite taken by its intrinsic charm. I can assure the member that I have and will continue to do all within my power to ensure that the capital investment required to keep Explorers open is forthcoming from the Executive. It is something I have brought to the Executive table. It is something I will ensure stays on the Executive table. And I look forward to a positive announcement in the not-so-distant future. Well, Mr. Fergal McKinney. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? And is the Minister aware of any support uh, from any other department in relation to the Explorers Business Plan? Uh, particularly, for example, in relation to its tourism potential. 
I uh, thank Mr McKinney for the question. Various uh, departments have expressed support for Explorus and the business plan prepared by Ardsborough Council. However, as of yet, no minister, including the Deity Minister, who is responsible for tourism, has of yet formally agreed to the proposals set out in the business plan, including the provision of the capital grant of £900,000. The purpose of the executive paper that I have tabled is to obtain their formal approval. Before I ask uh, Mr. Cree, could I just remind members to avail of the nearest microphone as it, uh, it causes difficulties for hands? Uh, Mr. McCree, Mr. Cree. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I also thank the Minister for his positive responses. Minister, there's been talk about capital for this. Uh, has any work been done? Does indeed the business plan cover the resource um, required going forward? I thank the, the member for his question. The business case basically outlines the fact that without this capital injection, explorers must close. However, with this capital uh, in cash injection, with these necessary improvements made, that explorers can be put on a sound business footing for years to come. I have committed and have reiterated that uh, to Mr McCarthy today in terms of revenue funding up to £120,000 per year from my department. That's the cost associated with the seal sanctuary. It doesn't usually come anywhere near that amount, but that, that's how much I am prepared to fund it. And I call Mr Cahillow Housing. I've got the previous asking for your question for Hayne, the question for I strongly support the principle of increased cooperation between North and South and greater harmonisation of planning policy to address the common environmental challenges we face wherever that is appropriate. Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland share similar strategic development issues and it makes sense to work together on these matters of common interest where this can provide mutual benefit to all parts of this island. In working towards policy harmonisation, my planning officials already communicate, cooperate and share practices on a regular basis with officials from the South on issues of common interest, and I will ensure that they continue to do so. In addition, high-level cooperation exists between both jurisdictions in relation to strategic planning for infrastructure, and there are also well-established transboundary consultation arrangements in relation to planning applications and development plans being considered under the Environmental Impact Assessment Regulations and the Environmental Assessment of Plans and Programmes Regulations. I acknowledge that wind energy development has in recent times become a controversial issue, both in the north and south. In response to those concerns, I undertook to use the opportunity of the consultation on the single strategic planning policy statement to listen to the views of people on this issue. I will also seek to take account of any recommendations that may emerge from the ongoing Environment Committee inquiry into wind energy. At the same time, I am also aware that the planning rules governing wind energy in the Republic are currently subject to review and potential changes. Last year, the Department of Environment, Community and Local Government published consultation proposals on proposed revisions to that department's wind energy development guidelines in relation to noise, separation distance and shadow flicker. DCLG indicated that following consideration of the submissions, the revisions to the guidelines will be finalised and adopted. When this happens, my officials will consider them and advise me accordingly. Mr. Hoshin for supplement. Will the Minister ensure that uh, this matter will be brought up at the next North South Ministerial Council and uh, what plans will he have to meet uh, Phil Hogan on this matter? As I thank the member for that supplementary question. As outlined in my first answer, I believe that cooperation on strategic environmental and planning matters is an issue of great importance that can provide mutual benefit to all parts of this island. As I said, the North and the Republic of Ireland share similar strategic development issues, opportunities and challenges. High-level cooperation already exists between both jurisdictions, and I will ensure that my officials continue to communicate, cooperate and share practices on a regular basis. I will also 
discuss this with Minister Hogan. In my view, a formal arrangement through the NSMC would be to everyone's benefit. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm sure upon reading the text of the question and listening to the Minister's answer, particularly when they talk about references to an all-island basis, uh, the good people of Rathlin Island might feel excluded from the, the question and answer. But the more serious issue, can the Minister uh, respond in terms of offshore wind energy, particularly when we get to areas like outstanding natural beauty areas off the northeast coast of Northern Ireland? that uh, more attention will be paid to ensuring that they are protected in the event of any future application, such as one was there about seven years ago? I uh, thank the member for his question and can assure himself and residents on Rathlin that I, I, I mean them no uh, offence. The issue of offshore wind is one that has come to the fore again in re recent months and is one that will divide opinion, undoubtedly. I believe it's vitally important that we have in place policies as the Department not only of Environment but as an executive on uh, offshore wind as well as onshore wind and how we best deal with these type of applications in a way that can generate, if you like, the electricity that we require, generate the employment and investment that we desire yet protect and preserve the environment that we cherish. I call Mr Loris Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I welcome the Minister's commitment to an all-island energy uh, policy. Could the Minister uh, highlight whether or not um, uh, he has any concerns around the security of an all-island energy uh, uh, availability and whether he would agree with me or not that uh, there needs to be a greater education amongst the public in terms of alternative energy sources. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank Ms. Kelly for that question. Again, the issue around the security of electricity supply is one that keeps coming up again and again uh, in meetings that I have both on the constituency level and in a ministerial capacity, and I believe that we all have a duty as elected representatives to educate our electorate on these matters and the importance of us establishing security of supply and the role that renewable energies and embra us embracing renewable energies will have in providing us with that security of supply and potential and existing inward investors, that security as well, security of knowledge that our electricity market is going to remain stable and that we, we as a region aren't going to be undercut and outpriced by other regions uh, bidding for inward investment. Call Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that. Given that uh, there is much more renewable energy going into the electric grid system at the moment, including wind energy, uh, can the Minister explain why electricity prices are continuing to rise to the consumer instead of coming down as predicted uh, through renewable energy sources? I thank the member for that supplementary question. However, I must advise him, as I'm sure he well knows, that it would be better directed towards another minister. Uh, uh, in this assembly. I, as uh, Environment Minister, do bear responsibility for climate change policy for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. I believe that is something that we share collective responsibility for. And while I deal with the planning aspect of uh, renewable energy, particularly energy from wind, the Minister responsible for energy is uh, Minister Foster, uh, the Deputy Minister. Talking about wind, that very successfully uh, spun that out. At the end of the period for listed questions, and we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister to give us an update on the progress of BMAP, the Belfast Metropolitan Area Plan, which has been running for some years? It's on the DOE website in, in draft in 2004. 
and still has not been adopted by DOE. I understand the life is to run out in 2015. Uh, and thank Mr. Dunn for that question. He quite rightly points out, or I, I believe brings to this chamber, concerns that exist in the wider community in Belfast and beyond around the lack of appearance to date of BMAP. He points to the dates. This has been in creation, if you like, since 2004. There is a notional end date for 2015. And I, as Minister responsible for its publication, believe that it is vitally important that this appears on the shelves before we pass the sell-by date, or best before date. Sorry. Uh, I have raised the issue of BMAP at the Executive. BMAP has gone through all the statutory processes it needs to. It was signed off by Minister Kennedy, got its Certificate of General Conformity, and I have brought it to the Executive for approval, and that is where it currently sits. Coming out of that, uh, an Executive subgroup on BMAP was uh, established, a meeting of which I have chaired to hear some concerns from some ministers on some aspects of BMAP. However, I am coming under increasing pressure, and I believe all members will be, from uh, businesses, uh, social house housing providers and so forth, to ensure that we get BMAP out and published as soon as possible and as soon as practical. And I can ask Mr Dunn maybe to implore his executive party colleagues to ensure that I can do so. I call Mr. Dunn for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister advise on how BMAP, the plan, will fit in in conjunction with other councils, such as North Down and Arch, where there will be two plans running under the one council, you have BMAP and the North Down, or sorry, the Arch plan? How will the planning decisions be made in, in that case? When you have two different policy documents. Uh, thank the member for that interesting question, and it, it's vitally important that these documents complement each other rather than compete with each other. I suppose uh, many of these questions or queries will be addressed as we move forward with the transfer of planning to local government. And I'm aware that some shadow councils have already commenced work on their own new local development plans in conjunction with my planning officials. I think that's vitally important, but it again brings focus back as to why we need BMAP published, why we need it adopted, and why, I, in my opinion, it's high time that the executive, I suppose, acceded to my request to adopt it. I to call Mr. Loris Kelly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I had thought I'd be addressed to you as Mr Speaker by this stage, but it appears not to be just at the moment. Um, but can I ask uh, the Minister for the Environment, uh, I'm receiving a lot of uh, uh, letters from staff employed within planning service. Uh, could the Minister outline how it's going to be um, decided upon where staff are going to be located, how are staff going to be consulted, and, and just what criteria is going to be used uh, to inform uh, the decision makers? Uh, I thank Mrs Kelly for her very pertinent question. This is not dissimilar to a question raised by uh, Mr Easton in ordinary time, if you like, only he was referring to DRD staff who may be transferring to deal with the, the, the functions transferring from DRD. And well, I can't really st stand here or shouldn't be standing here slagging off other departments and what they have to be doing to allay the concerns of their staff without me being able to do it myself. Great uh, steps have been taken to ensure that staff will be placed where staff want to be placed, and that's a pro planning staff want to be placed, and that's a process that's been underway for some considerable time now. And uh, members will have, I'm sure, noticed within their own local planning office quite a bit of reshuffling or rearranging of the furniture as new faces appear and others move on to other offices. Not all planning staff will be transferring to local government. However, we will have to retain planning staff centrally. Also, these decisions will be looked at in the round. 
and that round will be coming very soon. Call, I call Ms Kelly for a supplementary. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, it, it is particularly uh, women with uh, caring responsibilities that have uh, some concerns about how this is going to be managed. So just uh, wonder and, and ask if those uh, people who have particular uh, family responsibilities will be given an opportunity to have their say and have their needs taken account of. Uh, I can assure Ms Kelly, that this certainly will be uh, taken into account. It's vitally important that, that we protect our uh, workforce, that we ensure that we are not making people or rendering people incapable of work, by, by meaning that those with care and responsibilities would have to travel impracticable amounts of miles to go to work, be it, even, or be it especially on a part-time basis. So yes, the needs of staff are very much to the fore in my thinking when dealing with staffing issues. Thank you. And I call Ms Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I can ask the Minister what enforcement um, measures his department have in place in relation to the illegal dumping of tyres? That's uh, seems that Members never tire of, of questions about tyres. I've had a, a good year of them now. <laughs> you're, you're, you're tread carefully. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the dumping of illegal tyres is one that causes headaches for my department, for local councils, and for the general public. And it's one that I'm happy to say, and no pun intended this time, we are slowly but surely getting to uh, grips with. It's something that I am uh, actually also working with my counterpart in the Republic of Ireland on. I think it's important that we have a cohesive, joined up approach in this, as is oft often it is the case where tyres from down south are dumped up here and uh, vice versa. This will actually go so far as to the establishment of a producer responsibility scheme, which uh, I believe is in the long term going to be vitally important in the battle against the dumping of tyres, which are extremely damaging and detrimental to the environment. In the short term, uh, my department and or sorry, my officials do work closely with councils on this issue through our fly tipping uh, protocol. However, I do believe that there is room for improvement in the relationship between my officials and certain councils on this particular issue, and I, I think it's vital that we, we do work together to address it. Man for supplementary. Thank you. Thank the Minister for his answer. Um, more specifically, in relation to the Ballyduff bonfire site in my constituency, a number of residents have expressed some concerns about the amount of tyres which have recent, uh, recently appeared at the site. Can the Minister assure us that, the, that his department, along with um, working with the residents and the PSNI and other um, groups, will work to ensure that those tyres are removed? I thank uh, Ms Cameron for the, the supplementary. I am glad that in her question she pointed out the fact that my department can only do this in conjunction with other agencies, with the Council, with the local community and with the, the, the PSNI, and I can assure Ms Cameron, I can assure all members in, in this House that my department will not be found wanting when it comes to working with other agencies to and the community to address this issue. And I call Mr Mickey Brady. Just a point of information before I start. Um, the Minister alluded to my parking abilities earlier. I would have to say I arrive at the building far too early for the Minister even to see me. <laughs> and secondly, for someone in his, with his elevated status, he doesn't have to worry about parking having a driver. <laughs> but I think we'll leave it at that. Um, I, I could not let that pass, uh, pre last can call you. Uh, the question is, as the Minister is aware, there's been a lot of local opposition to his decision particularly from uh, town city centre traders and the Chamber of Commerce for his decision to uh, allow uh, out-of-town 
uh, Night of Town development um, at Carnbain, which is approximately three kilometres from Newry City Centre. Um, and I'm just wondering, has the Minister thought about reconsidering his decision on this particular project? Gurumai, uh, I thank the member for the question. And, and I do know that Mickey always arrives early just to make sure he does get a parking space. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I mean, people, it's topical questions, the, not the topical member, debate. <laughs> the member quite rightly uh, uh, points out that my decision to proceed with an approval for an uh, out-of-town multi-use development on the, uh, on the edge of Newry has has caused some consternation in the, the, the Newry area. He asks whether I have decided to reconsider the, 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 my decision. Now, I have subsequent to my decision, which I do believe in the long term will be good for the Newry area. However, I have, since my uh, announcement of my approval, granted a meeting to the Newry Chamber of Commerce and other uh, local interests who are vociferous in their opposition to my decision. Uh, they have outlined a very strong case, I have to say, and brought new information to my attention. They have asked me to visit Newry with a view to having a look around the, the city centre, and I have agreed to do so in advance of my issuing of any green form. I have also agreed to a site meeting with the applicant in this case, as I believe that is only fair. Mr. Brady, for a supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer, and I'm sure he'll be very welcome in Newry. Um, Newry City Centre has approximately 70 acres for redevelopment. Um, and I'm just wondering if the Minister could give us some idea of what he considers an appropriate distance for out of town development from the city centre. Go to my God. Uh, thank uh, Mr. Brady for his uh, su supplementary question, and uh, he alluded to current space available within Newry City Centre. This is an issue that was raised to me by those representatives of the Chamber of Commerce when, when they came to see me, and I look forward to seeing it for myself. When we talk about appropriate distance, I, I'm going to say, and I did say it and have said it actually since I took on this ministry, that each application will be judged on its own merits or otherwise. What is suitable for one area may not be deemed suitable for another. So I, to ask what distance would be deemed suitable is akin to asking how long is a piece of string. Call Mr Peter Weir. Thank you Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, given uh, media reports of a large quantities of um, alcohol being cleared away from Crawfordsburn Country Park, not for the, the first time but indeed uh, there have been a number of occasions over the last few years and indeed with uh, result in sort of litter problems as well. What additional help or resources can the Minister give uh, to the hard-pressed staff at Crawfordsburn Country Parks to ensure then that uh, everyone can get the fullest enjoyment of this uh, magnificent facility? Uh, I thank uh, Mr Weir for that question and actually most thank him for bringing this issue to my attention as it hasn't been brought to my attention before. However, I have since uh, being appointed Minister 11 months ago, I actually had occasion to visit uh, Crawfordsburn Country Park on two occasions. I must say it is an excellent and beautiful facility. Therefore, I would be happy to give my pledge to Mr Weir that I will ensure that my officials work hard to support those charged with uh, maintaining uh, Crawfordsburn Country Park and uh, maintaining it uh, uh, as a clean place that we can all go and enjoy. It brings an end to uh, the, the question. I thank the, uh, the Minister. We must move on to questions.